thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much uh, for SAT to invite me to speak on behalf of the UNFCC Regional Collaboration Center here at your Sustainability Forum. It's a great honor and pleasure. And I will be uh, speaking, basically what you will hear from me is a little bit of an extension what you just heard from Mr. Grabat uh, in, the, in the remarks, a little bit more detailed on integrity on, of carbon markets and recommendation for ethical use of carbon credits. And um, as you may expect inviting someone speaking on behalf of the UNFCC Center. I will also be talking about Article 6 and I hope um, I can share a little bit of um, uh, insights. Um, the presentation will is more focusing uh, on the use of carbon credit. I thought that was maybe the interest, but you can also turn around, look at it at the from the point of view of a carbon credit project developer. So I think there is enough for both um, sides. Um, let me just start with where do we stand to um, give a little bit of background on why we need carbon markets uh, and what is the relevance of carbon markets. So, um, since the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, um, yeah, it was clear that we need to uh, reduce, to, to stay on the two degrees or ideally 1.5 degrees pathway, we need some deep decarbonization within this uh, decade towards 2030. And at the time um, of signing the uh, Paris Agreement, we were on a, a pathway to a 16% increase of emissions by 2030. Um, we have now, with new NDCs and uh, start of implementation, uh, reached a trajectory of a 3% increase, but that's obviously still far away from where we need to be. So by 2030, we need to reduce by 42%. So there's still a large uh, gap. Uh, and if we were to implement the unconditional NDCs entirely, we would still be on a trajectory of a rise of temperature above pre-industrial levels of 2.9 degrees and fully implementing conditional NDCs, it's a little better at 2.5. Um, so we do see since the signing of the Paris Agreement, there is some progress. It's just much too slow and we're still far away from the 1.5 degree trajectory. So um, to implement these NDCs, uh, there are huge financial implications. So the requirements for uh, fully implementing NDCs and reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement and the 2030 agenda, um, there's different estimates, but um, um, this number is quite uh, commonly used, at least 5.8 to 5.9 trillions uh, to deliver these NDCs. Um, Carbon markets have been identified as one very important tool to reach or to reduce the cost of NDC implementations, thereby bringing us close, closer to reaching these targets. Um, and the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement actually um, introduces also the use of carbon markets. Um, so what are carbon markets? I'm not going to go much into detail. I expect most of you to be familiar, but just um, to bring us closer then to uh, the Article 6 discussion, carbon markets is a trading system for carbon credits that can be sold and bought. Um, it's also called emission trading, and usually we're talking about a ton of CO2 or uh, equivalent of a different greenhouse gas equaling one carbon credit. That's, yeah, one ton uh, equivalent. Um, and carbon finance through Article 6, as I mentioned already, can then uh, play a very important role in implementing the NDCs. And 83% of countries that submitted NDCs also mentioned the intention to use 
uh, carbon market. So there's certainly a growing interest by countries uh, in using carbon markets, uh, but not only by countries, as we will see. When we talk about carbon markets, um, it's always easy, carbon markets, but what stands behind it? It's not like one single market. It's actually very different elements combined uh, that, com yeah, that, that are combined for the international carbon market. So we have a voluntary carbon market, um, which is probably most interesting for most of you in this room. It's, it's the part of the carbon market where corporates or individual set targets, net zero, climate net zero targets, um, and then voluntary uh, besides on emissions then reducing um, by using carbon credits that are governed by uh, international uh, organizations uh, independent carbon standards. We also have a compliance market, um, which is mostly carbon taxes, ETS, other carbon pricing instruments that are introduced by countries. Um, and we have companies under these instruments that have compliance targets and they uh, receive usually emission allowances, especially under the ETS, but can also use carbon credits, other carbon credits from carbon crediting projects to offset part of their emissions. So that's what we refer to as the compliance market. And then we have Article 6, uh, the Article 6 market, who is uh, designed for countries also to meet uh, their NDCs cooperatively, meaning international cooperation, exchange of uh, emission um, credits, um, when they are transferred, these units are called ITMOs, and they're initially designed the Article 6 market really for international cooperation to reach the NDC targets. Um, they can also be used now, as we will see, uh, not only for uh, NDC targets, but also um, have, a, have a function in the voluntary carbon market. So the Article 6 actually is an element that covers both of these other two um, markets. Um, yeah, they, these are internationally regulated by the Paris Agreement and then um, uh, regulation that have been put in place for these articles. Um, just also really want you to understand different uses of Article 6. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, so countries should actually take a lead uh, to solving the climate crisis to implement and reach their NDC targets. But there's also a very important role for non-state actors um, who should also get involved into net zero developments, net zero targets by 2050. And um, the UN Secretary General has initiated the high-level expert group on net zero emission commitments uh, for non-state entities. So that is an initiative to create better standards, stronger and clearer standards for net zero emission pledges uh, by um, businesses, investors, cities, other non-state state actors. Um, that is an important step because we've lived with carbon markets for the past 15, almost 20 years, and there are some certain shortcomings, and if um, they are not regulated properly, um, what uh, we understand under an integrity in the market may be looked at very different from different uh, people. So this is an initiative to just establish some common standards for net zero pledges, and then we will also see um, how that, um, under this initiative, the use of carbon credits is seen. Um, integrity of carbon markets, so that's, that's the goal of this uh, initiative, uh, is very important um, if we use carbon markets not to run the risk of increasing emissions. We want to use it as a tool to further reduce emission, to enhance uh, ambition, and to really 
uh, have some positive net impact. So that is one important uh, principle that when you're trading uh, emission reductions or mitigation outcomes, um, it should always have a, a positive a balance, so more reductions than without uh, the carbon market. But then also we have the issue of uh, quality of carbon credits itself um, because different standards are being used. Not all of them have the same uh, strict uh, stringency on, on the baseline and other elements. So there are some principal issues which you have probably also heard over the past years with transparency and accountability, but also how the host country is involved. There are some independent international standards that didn't require host country involvement. Um, how is the baseline set? So how do I actually measure the reduction? Um, then, of course, uh, we've heard a lot about greenwashing and claims that were not really backed up by um, real emission reductions. So, integrity of the carbon market is a very important um, aspect, and more and more initiatives are in place and regulations are being put in place to also regain some trust. Uh, we have to admit that carbon market may have lost, may have had a trust issue and lost some trust over the past years. You've probably heard that. So with these new standards, um, certainly want to establish a uh, high quality carbon market. Um, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement is now one of these um, elements of international carbon market. It was introduced by parties um, in the Paris Agreement to initi um, initiate um, more participation also by non-state actors that are then authorized by parties. So especially public and private sector participation is enhanced through Article 6. It is actually the only article in the Paris Agreement that specifically aims at private sector contributions to um, yeah, the climate goals and here to reduce emissions under the NDCs. Um, oh my God, I didn't switch forward. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> Good, but here um, I'll just, I'm just showing the three elements of Article 6. Just as a reminder, um, we have cooperative approaches under six, uh, Article 6.2, which is actually an accounting um, mechanism. So countries that cooperate with each other, and you have a very good example here already in Thailand as one of the first countries using Article 6.2 um, this Thailand-Switzerland um, e-bus project is really globally one of the first um, making use of this cooperative approach under 6.2. Again, it's directly between countries, but of course also private sector has to be uh, involved and is involved to implement the projects uh, itself. Um, so that's definitely still an opportunity for private sector to get involved. And then we have the mechanism under 6.4, which is a carbon crediting mechanism similar to the um, CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, as you may still remember from uh, the Kyoto Protocol. It's a centrally governed uh, mechanism, so the rules are made by the uh, supervisory body, um, which is then also supported by the UNFCC Secretariat, um, also operating the registry and everything. So that's a mechanism that's being put in place. Um, it's a ready to use, to be used um, mechanism. So while under 6.2 the two cooperating countries have to agree on the rules, there are some international guidance of course, um, but the mechanism basically um, there are some participation requirements but countries can use it once it is operational and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, 6.8 is a framework on non-market approaches and since it's not related to the exchange of carbon credits we're not going to touch on this much today. Um, so yeah, where do we stand with um, uh, Article 6? So Article 6.2 
Um, I mentioned the Thai-Swiss cooperation and also other countries globally have started cooperations. There's not a lot of projects yet, but there is more and more um, direct um, talks between countries, MOUs are being put in place, and projects are slowly being developed. But then, um, the, here we call it, I call it the PACM, it's actually its new official name, the Paris Agreement Crediting Mechanism, that's the Article 6.4 mechanism. Um, you've pro probably heard from last COP that there was no outcome on uh, 6.4 in Dubai, and it was really uh, a bit unexpected, but also a little bit of a wake-up call that there are still um, some uh, very uh, intense discussions on some elements, for example, on the removal, uh, which is supposed to be also an important part, um, carbon removal projects um, under 6.4, but also in the voluntary carbon market, um, it makes quite a large, large portion of the trade. Um, so these methodological and, and removal guidance were not adopted at Dubai, but we will, um, of course, go back uh, to the next COP in, in uh, um, Baku, Azerbaijan, at the end of the year, and hopefully countries will then be able to agree on this to finally um, operationalize, because you need this guidance to develop methodologies for projects to actually start registering new projects. By then, the mechanism registry by the end of the year would also be in place. Um, we have, uh, to date, 82 countries who have nominated a designated national authority as basically an entity in the country that is responsible for all the 6.4 um, operations, so to, for example, provide host country approval and, and uh, set also some uh, sustainability rules in countries. So only 82 countries, so still uh, quite of a number of countries uh, need to join. Um, we have also CDM activities that are migrating to the PACM, so once the host countries agree on this migration, we will have the first actual Article 6.4 uh, projects, uh, which could happen um, at any time uh, from now onwards until the end of next year. Um, and we have Article 6 standards that are fully aligned with the rules that parties made in, in Glasgow. Um, so the SBM, that's the uh, supervisory body of this mechanism, will continue this year in 2024 to operationalize the mechanism, develop the standards, guidelines, tools that are um, needed, and then um, we expect operationalization towards the end of the year, early uh, 2025, which means then also new projects can be uh, submitted and registered. Um, the benefits of particip participation in this uh, mechanism, um, the, it's, uh, it's the mechanism under the Paris Agreement, so it is um, agreed by parties. The level of international recognition is, is very high. Um, it has very strong provisions on environmental integrity, sustainability uh, development, and stakeholders. Um, it also provides funding, I think you've heard it in the opening remark, directly to the um, adaptation fund, but also in the host country it can have uh, uh, some co-funding revenues for adaptation uh, activities. And the credits created under this mechanism could either be uh, authorized for international cooperation, but if they're not authorized, they could also contribute directly to the host country's NDC. So um, if you have an Article 6 uh, project, 6.4 project in Thailand and you don't authorize the, um, the transfer of credits to another country, it will actually directly contribute to Thailand's uh, NDCs. Um, now, uh, another couple of words on uh, integrity. I mentioned uh, already um, this high-level um, expert group for net zero emission commitments that was established really to develop stronger guidance. It has a very clear uh, net zero 
uh, sorry, zero tolerance for net zero greenwashing um, and really a strong emphasis on environmental integrity, credibility, but also role of the governments is very important. And um, this um, expert group came up with a couple of principles for using uh, voluntary carbon credits. So while there is a strong ongoing discussions on how, if, where and when uh, carbon credits can be used or should be used. Um, one of the premises here is uh, that really voluntary uh, purchase of carbon credits by non-state actors, meaning in this case business or cities, uh, can play an important role in supporting faster emission reduction and also sustainable development. So in principle, um, um, definitely recognizes that carbon credits can play an important role. Um, it is very important to define clear standards for the integrity um, and also for the claims that are being made because um, claims can also be very unclear, meaning business could say we are carbon neutral while if you look at it very closely, um, maybe there's a lack of integrity either on the credits or on the projects. So um, that is very important. It's really important to also when you use carbon credits that it really does, there's no risk of delaying uh, emission reductions, meaning own uh, emission reductions. So it should be an additional part of your net zero strategy, but it should not delay um, own emissions reductions by no means. So that is very important. Um, yeah, and then um, as, as we see, there's a lot of new guidance being developed for carbon, uh, for integrity of carbon markets, for claims, demand and supply side. So a lot of work is ongoing and still not uh, finalized, though we, we do come closer to seeing there in a strong agreement on some guiding principles. Um, just uh, coming to the end, a few recommendations also made by this panel. So again, um, emphasizing the uh, prioritized urgent deep reduction in the value chain. So before really using carbon credits, look at your own um, emission reduction opportunity. Um, High integrity uh, carbon credits should be used to beyond value chain mitigation means you could use them if you set your emission pathways towards neutrality by 2050, you will not reach it within uh, one or two years. So it's a long term pathways um, and you will always have like year by year some own new measures, mitigation measures, emission reductions that you implement. And there will also be kind of a part of emissions that you will only be able to reduce in the next 10, 20 years. But for this part of emission that you're not able to to reduce, so outside of your pathway, you could use um, carbon credits and actually a good addition to mobilize uh, finance for other projects. Um, so it's, it's really a mechanism to facilitate a finance support. Um, yeah, two, I mean, just as a really high level quality criteria, and there's a lot of other criteria, really detailed checklists, but additionality is very important and permanence of emission reductions. And now, a um, little bit more detailed recommendation when you use carbon credits, and I mentioned in the beginning, I'm more talking about the use of carbon credits. You can turn this around also for project developers, of course, when you develop projects for carbon credits. Um, use credible governed standard bodies. So there's a lot of standards out there, but you should always go for the ones with really positive social and economic outcomes. Um, you should uh, look at really a rights-based approach, making sure that the rights of indigenous people and local communities are always well respected and protected. 
Um, it should be transparently reported how you use the claims and whether they are also used for a country's uh, NDC or not, um, maybe the host country, maybe under uh, international transfers. So that has to be very clear, otherwise there is a risk of double counting, double claiming. Um, and then um, also prioritization of, of programs um, that really look at the needs of people, needs of sectors that need more support. Uh, for example, biodiversity, restoration of degraded land, building resilience, um, um, also supporting projects with hard to abate um, new technologies. Yeah, coming to the end, uh, just quickly wanted to mention that the RCC, the Regional Collaboration Center that I represent here today, is one of six of such collaboration centers established by the UNFCCC. We're lucky to have this center uh, that's covered the Asia Pacific region. Uh, it's a regional center, it's based here in Bangkok, so that also gives us the opportunity to uh, engage with you directly today. Um, but then also um, we are very active uh, with our colleagues from the UN uh, Residence Coordinators Office and other UN agencies um, also over the past years been supporting uh, some of the carbon initiatives here as uh, briefings by the UN to the Standing Committee on Monetary Finance and Financial Instruments and Carbon Markets, also waste separation projects with the Ministry of uh, in, um, in what is it? IOM. Uh, in turn, forgot it, I'm sorry. But then um, the, also we had a, three years ago, just before um, Glasgow, very important initiative with the colleagues from the UN Global Compact Network, uh, a webinar, we're also happy to repeat this at some point, um, the race to zero for private sector um, uh, engagement. So um, a lot going on from our side. And I just noticed that I skipped a couple slides on my pointer. So sorry, good. Um, but I hope um, gave you a little bit of a feeling on where we stand with Article 6 and how international carbon markets are developing, especially with regard to integrity um, and the use of carbon credits. Thank you very much. And, um, Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Thank you.